Greetings Astronomy 10 and welcome back to your chapter 17 lecture. Uh, this will be the only lecture on chapter 17 as it's not really that long. Uh, we do have some interesting theoretical physics to go over. Uh, we're nearing the end of the semester here and uh, so today we're going to talk about essentially the very large scale uh, questions about the universe, uh, how galaxies and galaxy clusters interact and evolve over the course of time, how they came to be, uh, where dark matter is likely coming from, and uh, <clears throat> essentially what the ultimate fate of the universe is going to be in the distant future. So, let's start with a couple of things that we already know. Namely that Galaxy groups, like our own local galactic group, <clears throat> are gravitationally bound together. It is possible that <clears throat> some members of a galaxy group population, a local group <clears throat> population, may, you know, the ones at the periphery, especially the ones at the edge, may gravitationally interact somewhat with members of another group or cluster. However, <clears throat> the group itself is generally gravitationally bound, and eventually they're going to form, you know, one large galaxy over the course of time. <clears throat> this group of galaxies, however, usually belongs to a larger group of groups which is a gravi gravitationally interactive cluster or supercluster. <clears throat> we, for example, are a member of the Virgo supercluster, right? The local group is just one tiny little galactic group in this tremendous supercluster that has tons and tons of galaxies in it called the Virgo supercluster. <clears throat> and of course, there are tons and tons of superclusters everywhere in the universe, everywhere that we kind of look at them. If you wanted to look at any portion of the sky, as long as you have a sufficiently powerful telescope, of course, <clears throat> you're going to see clusters and super clusters, and the deeper and farther back you go, you're going to see more and more of them. <clears throat> now, as human beings, <clears throat> we want to try to kind of instinctively make patterns out of the galaxies that we see and the galaxy clusters and so on that we see and so if you look at I think it's the fourth yeah the fourth image um, <clears throat> this is like a, a sample of galaxies that are and galaxy clusters essentially um, that are all kind of uh, their positions relative to us have sort of been mapped out. And as human beings, we kind of want to instinctively make a pattern out of it, right? Now, <clears throat> if you look at this image, do you see a pattern? It's okay if you do. Whether or not the pattern is actually there is the subject of... Uh, a larger debate and we'll come back to that in just a moment but if you look at that does it kind of look like there's a pattern they call it the stick man and if you didn't see it before you probably see it now right everyone's drawn stick figures before <clears throat> but uh, yeah you know instinctively we look at something like that and we want to make a pattern out of it but if you look at the next image the fifth one it says volume sampled in A, that's, and if you look kind of at the, the very near part to where the, the cones kind of cross, the stick man is in there, right? There's a few more galaxies, it's, you know, a slightly different sample population, but the stick man's in there, right? And at a larger scale, it doesn't really look like as much of a pattern, right? It kind of looks much more random. So there are lots of galaxies, and there are lots of clusters of galaxies, and superclusters of galaxies in the universe. 
but there are also some empty spaces in between them. We call these empty spaces kind of like the same thing we call black cats, right? We call them voids. <clears throat> I know you've heard that before, that's a void cat right there. Um, but in any case, uh, there are spaces in between galaxies and galaxy clusters. Empty sort of spaces that we call voids. We think <clears throat> that the larger clusters, these super clusters, came from smaller clusters, and those smaller clusters came from smaller groups, <clears throat> and those smaller groups came from, you know, smaller, even smaller groups, and so on, until you go all the way back to tiny, itty-bitty, little, ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. <clears throat> we call this hierarchical clustering. Now, how could we possibly know that something like this actually existed, right? Well, <clears throat> Um, we tried looking at computer simulations of the Big Bang <clears throat> and trying to see if we could come up with a similar kind of distribution of galaxies. And we came up with a random distribution, but it didn't quite look like ours. But, you know, we went into this experiment figuring that it probably wouldn't be exactly the same. That's kind of crazy talk, right? A little ludicrous. But that didn't quite have all the answers that we wanted. <clears throat> and so we had to take a, a step back and consider dark matter. <clears throat> now according to the Big Bang Theory, just after the universe was created, there should only be two elements, right? Hydrogen and helium. With possibly a little bit of boron, right? Element number three. And if we look at the amounts of helium and deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, it's just hydrogen with an extra neutron in the nucleus, right? Um, if we look at the amounts of helium, stable helium, of course, helium-4, and deuterium in the universe now, they agree with the amount that should have been in the universe <coughs> at the Big Bang. And the deuterium isn't the single most stable of isotopes. It's not like tremendously unstable or whatever, but over the course of time we think that, you know, from collisions with uh, other atoms and, uh, you know, various processes or whatever, that the amount of deuterium in the universe should decrease. But, <clears throat> over the course of time, as stars fuse hydrogen into helium, the amount of helium in the universe should increase. And if we look at the, um, the abundance of deuterium and helium that's in the universe now, it agrees with what we call our Big Bang nucleosynthesis, or the amount of um, these, the abundances of these elements that we think should have been around uh, shortly after the Big Bang. <clears throat> so this is yet another piece, important piece of evidence for the Big Bang. Uh, that, of course, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And um, <clears throat> there's a, a few other things, like the upper age limit for all of the radioactive materials in the universe. Uh, all of these things point to the same age that the universe is about 13.7 billion years old and so they all had to come from a single event, the Big Bang. In any case, <clears throat> while this Big Bang nucleosynthesis is good evidence for the Big Bang, that doesn't solve our dark matter problem, does it? Dark matter can't just be normal protons or, nucle or, or neutrons, right, or electrons. <clears throat> there would be more of those just after the Big Bang, and this would lead to more other elements in the universe today. So what could it be? Well, dark matter has to have no charge. No electric charge. So it can't be protons or electrons, right? 
and therefore it would not interact with electromagnetic radiation. Thus, dark matter was able to clump up together <coughs> and make sort of pockets of material. Clumps, however you want to call it. Even in the early universe. And if we think about star formation, then we can kind of get an idea of how dark matter would eventually kind of self-gravitate to form these clumps, which would eventually, in turn, affect the development of a galaxy structure. <clears throat> but we're still no closer to figuring out exactly what dark matter is, right? Well, the going theory is that dark matter could be possibly of two varieties, either what we call cold dark matter, which is kind of slow moving, or hot dark matter, which moves fast. <clears throat> hot dark matter could be things like neutrinos. But according to our theoretical models, right, everything from theoretical physics, particle physics, astrophysics, we predict that probably only about 5% of the matter in the universe could be neutrinos. Now, our theoretical model has served us very well. It's helped us understand star formation, the evolution of stars, the population of stars in the universe, thermonuclear fusion, quantum mechanics, all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So there's no reason to doubt it now. We know it's right. And unless we discover some other process by which we think that neutrinos could possibly be produced, there's no reason for us to assume that neutrinos could make up more than about 5% of the matter in the universe. <clears throat> so that's not it. That's part of the answer, but only a small part. So what's the rest? Well, cold dark matter could be possibly this uh, theoretical particle called an axion, which we haven't found, <clears throat> which is uh, one of the diagrams. Or it could possibly be another particle called the Photino, which in theory could be about 10,000 times the mass of a proton. But we haven't found that either. But what we have found is the Higgs boson, which is another one of these theoretical particles. So. Who knows, anything's possible. It is entirely possible that maybe someday we will find <coughs> the balance of the missing particles and solve both the dark matter and probably even the dark energy problem. So, you know, just give it some time. <coughs> In any case, we're still no, dark, no closer to figuring out what dark matter is. But we do know that the first stars formed inside clumps of, these, of this dark matter. And as a result, they were generally more massive because the universe was much more dense. And so these stars were probably, you know, like big, bright, class O, class B stars. <clears throat> and because they burned so bright and so hot, they didn't live very long. And this put the first round of heavy elements into the universe after these big hot massive stars blew up and went supernova and created a bunch of elements up to including and heavier than iron in their cores if you remember probably all the way up you know to helium and neptunium and plutonium and so on this of course <coughs> Since now we have stars, right? Stars forming are going to attract other stars, and eventually you're going to have clumps and clusters of stars emerging out of these clumps of dark matter to eventually form the first galaxies. These tiny little galaxies, which were probably no more than a hundred thousand solar masses at the very most, most of them probably much less than that. We called those ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. 
And of course, <clears throat> these are much, much smaller than the galaxies that we see around today, the ones that we live in, the ones that are nearby, and so on, right? <clears throat> now, if we look very, very deep out into the universe, if we use a very sophisticated piece of equipment like the Hubble Space Telescope that, you know, doesn't have to put up with interference from the atmosphere, and if we kind of look in between the spaces, you know, at, at the spaces in between, excuse me, um, the galaxies and clusters that we've mapped out, if we take a bunch of images kind of all stacked up on top of each other, but not directly stacked up on top of each other, like here, 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 you know, all kind of looking at the same general area, right? <clears throat> we start to see evidence of these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies really, really far away from us. Now, we have to be very careful about what that means exactly, because the farther we look into the universe, the farther away we look into the universe, the farther we look back in time. Remember, light takes a certain amount of time to travel. We're not actually seeing the sun as it is now, if you go outside and look at the sun, which you shouldn't, by the way, please don't do that, because you'll burn your retinas and go blind, okay? Don't, don't stare at the sun, whatever you do. <clears throat> but if you were to examine light from the sun, this light does not represent the way that the sun looks now. The light from the sun represents the way the sun looked eight minutes ago, right? Because we're about eight light minutes from the sun. Similarly, the light from Alpha Centauri does not represent the way that Alpha Centauri looks right now. Alpha Centauri is 4.3 light years from us, and so we are seeing Alpha Centauri as it was 4.3 years ago. If we look at the Andromeda Galaxy, right? The Andromeda Galaxy is about two and a half million light years from us. And so, if we look at the Andromeda Galaxy, we are not seeing it as it is today. We're seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. <clears throat> Thus, if we look at these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies that are something like 13 billion light years from us, we're not seeing that galaxy as it is now. We're seeing as it was about 13 billion years ago. That's a really long time, and as a matter of fact, 13 billion years ago, that's you know, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. <clears throat> and so, the greater what we call the look-back time, the farther away these objects are, right? Or the farther away these objects are, the farther we're looking back into the past, the greater the look-back time. And what we observed is that the greater the look-back time, the farther and deeper we look into the universe and into the universe's history, the smaller and fainter these galaxies are. The farther we look back in time, the smaller the galaxies in the universe are. So this supports our idea, our theory, that once upon a time there was a Big Bang, and sometime after the Big Bang, when the universe was still hot and dense, there formed clumps and pockets of this dark matter, and in these pockets of dark matter there formed the first stars, and eventually the first tiny little ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. Now the converse, of course, must be true. Obviously, if we look further and further back in time, <clears throat> we're looking at much, much smaller galaxies, right? 
And the closer they, these galaxies are, if we look at our more immediate neighbors, the larger and more populous, if we're talking about stars as population, the more populous and larger and more massive and brighter these galaxies become. Thus, we can only conclude that over the course of time, galaxies evolve to become larger and more massive. Thus, the closer, the larger, the more evolved, the more massive, the brighter galaxies are. <clears throat> and so galaxies must evolve over the course of time just like our galaxy is currently evolving, and all the galaxies that we can see essentially are currently evolving through mergers. Now, I probably haven't mentioned this before, but uh, don't freak out. <coughs> the Milky Way galaxy is going to merge with the Andromeda galaxy. At some point, we're going to collide, but don't worry about it. <clears throat> we're already colliding with a couple of other galaxies, and even though they're much smaller, uh, the distances in between stars is so incredibly vast that while the Andromeda galaxy and <clears throat> the Milky Way galaxy have, you know, hundreds of billions of stars in them in total, when the two galaxies combine, there probably won't be any collisions. Maybe one or two at the most. Stars are not going to collide with each other, okay? Remember, our next nearest neighbor is 4.3 light years. It takes light 4.3 years to get here from our next closest neighbor, you know? Good luck trying to go over there to, to borrow a cup of sugar or whatever, right? But long story short, galaxies evolve through mergers over the course of time. Just like ours is evolving now. Okay. <clears throat> Before we wrap up today's lecture, let's talk a little bit about the ultimate fate of the universe. And uh, this should be the last image in today's image bank. <clears throat> Once upon a time, about... 13.7 billion years ago, there was an event called the Big Bang. And at about 10 to the minus 30-something seconds, a very, very short time after the Big Bang, <clears throat> the universe expanded at a much greater rate than it should have, just from energy moving, you know, in random directions or whatever, and having, like, a, an energy density pressure pushing the the stuff that made the universe out in all directions. There was an expansion. We call that inflation, and that's the reason that the universe is uh, much larger than 13.7 billion light years in radius. <clears throat> Sometime after that, about 10 to the 20 seconds or something like that, we started to make uh, essentially... Uh, like protons and neutrons and electrons. And sometime shortly thereafter, uh, there was an event we called recombination, where the energy density in the universe <coughs> went below the amount necessary for hydrogen atoms to actually occur in nature, right? So that the protons could actually have electrons in their ground state orbital around the single proton nuclei of hydrogen atoms. And shortly thereafter, oh, I gotta sneeze. Oh, excuse me. Uh, shortly thereafter, it was like a fog was lifted and photons were decoupled from the rest of the universe and light was able to travel through the universe, leaving behind essentially an energy density of cosmic microwave background radiation everywhere in the universe that we can see and that we've been able to measure. 
sometime thereafter, uh, stars started to form, galaxies and so on, and obviously life happened because we're here. Um, <clears throat> life has actually started more than once here on the surface of the Earth. There have been extinction level events like what uh, happened to kill the dinosaurs. And probably the only thing that survived was like anaerobic bacteria, things that lived in like volcanoes or something. And currently, we are in the era known as the Stelliferous Era, where there are lots of stars. And eventually, after about, let's see, thousand, million, billion, trillion, right? 10 to the power 12, <coughs> uh, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, that's 18, right? <clears throat> Quintillion, sextillion, septillion. That's 24. Uh, after about 10 septillion years or so, 10 to the 25 years after the Big Bang, the last star will form. <clears throat> after that, eventually the last star will burn out. Some you know, at the most 56 billion years after the last star forms, because that's how long class M stars take to burn through their hydrogen fuel in their cores and evolve off the main sequence. Eventually, <clears throat> we're only going to be left with stellar remnants, no more stars, right? And so, as far as, you know, luminous objects go, we're going to have, like, some white dwarfs, and neutron stars and things like that. <clears throat> and so we call that the degenerate era because there are only objects that are electron and even neutron degenerate. Only those things will remain. But sometime just short of about 10 to the 50 years, I'm not going to count whatever Ilion that is supposed to be because it's going to be a lot. But eventually, <clears throat> white dwarfs will decay uh, they are giving off light, right, which means they're losing energy. And eventually, <clears throat> they will disintegrate, right? They'll fall apart and lose all of their energy. And eventually, <clears throat> uh, they'll kind of just become nothing. They'll disappear. And at some time after that, neutron stars will decay. The decay mechanism by which neutron stars decay is a little bit different, of course, right? They're not giving off light so much the same way, but if you remember, pulsars give off a certain amount of electromagnetic radiation, and so even they, over the course of time, will eventually also decay. And after about 10 to the 50 years or so, the only thing that will be left in the universe <coughs> is black holes. Black holes, too, will eventually decay by Hawking radiation. If you remember when one of these, what we call virtual particle pairs, an electron-positron, <clears throat> if those get generated spontaneously near the event horizon of a black hole, maybe half of the pair will fall into the black hole into the event horizon, the other half will escape, right? <clears throat> and so there's kind of a steady outward pressure of these half virtual particle pairs and eventually, they too will lose mass and energy and deteriorate. Now eventually, what's supposed to happen <clears throat> when something loses enough energy that it reaches absolute zero, this temperature that we call the absolute zero at zero Kelvin, or about minus 273.15 degrees C, matter is supposed to stop existing, right? energy is supposed to flatline and go to nothing, right? All of the kinetic energy in a substance is supposed to deteriorate and go to zero. And when all of the matter in the universe, even black holes, right, from Hawking radiation, starting with the smaller black holes that are left behind from stars going supernova, <clears throat> and eventually even the supermassive black holes that are like at the cores of galaxies, even those are going to disperse into nothing. And when that happens, there will be nothing left in the universe. We call it the inevitable heat death of the universe.
but that will not happen for a Google of years. That is 10 to the power 100. So we've got a long time to go. Now I know a lot of people find that kind of <clears throat> depressing, sad, that eventually, you know, our, our model for physics predicts that the universe is going to be empty and everything is going to go to nothing. <clears throat> but I would like to turn your attention this time to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics <clears throat> in which there are essentially an infinite number of possible universes <clears throat> or possibilities that have led up to the point that we're at now. <clears throat> also, the universe came from nowhere. Who knows, right? We don't know what caused the Big Bang. We don't know where it came from. And so it's entirely possible that maybe we'll figure that out. Maybe we can start another universe. Or maybe one will start spontaneously on its own. But in all likelihood, <clears throat> if this universe is, which it very clearly is because we're here, right? Because I'm telling you about it and you're having your everyday experiences in this universe, right? And we're having all these common experiences together. If there was at one time a universe, which there is now, perhaps there were universes before it. And if there were universes before, there will undoubtedly be universes after. So who knows? There are questions that we may not be able to answer in our lifetimes. But we are searching for the answer. And we've found a whole lot of answers so far, so maybe we'll figure this out, too. Okay, that ends our Chapter 17 lecture. Next, next time, uh, we're going to talk about the search for life in the universe. That will be our final lecture for the semester. And I hope you've enjoyed this lecture as much as I have enjoyed giving it. See you next time.